It's um, a great pleasure for me tonight to introduce Rodney because um, for two things, he's uh, an amazing friend, a great friend, and also I'm always itching that when he comes next time he shows us uh, new things, new ideas, and new ways of looking at the world. Um, no signal. Okay, what um, I might do is uh, first I'm going to embarrass him a bit and then we'll get on to some um, facts. <laughs> but never mind, Rodney. It's, it's, it's not going to be deep embarrassment, just a few little um, tinges. But the, um, the important thing here is that I think from a few of us who are around the room tonight, we finished off at the end of the 70s. And some of the uh, things that we got up to, some can be said in a lecture theatre, others can't. But um, the, the thing about Rodney is that just um, before he was leaving and graduating and about to enter a new adventure, there were a few things that we used to get up to. One of them was, um, it was the end of the, don't worry Rodney, it's all right. <laughs> the end of the punk era, punk. Do you remember Johnny Rotten and the Damned and all of that business? Um, the, the other was at the beginning of New Romantics, and I think in this cusp it was um, the great memories I had of Rodney because we used to go out into Soho and have incredible times. And there was a certain person called Richard Strange in the Doctors of Madness, and he was also very tall. And he also had a great presence when he got onto stage. He never became famous, though, but I don't know why. He, um, he managed to generate an enormous passion with the audience. The clubs at that time were the Club for Heroes, The Great Wall, Cabaret Futura, and Zanzibar. Now, um, these kind of things gave a fabric, gave a complexion to the kind of things that we all did after. And Rodney, as um, moved on to do very, very special things. And, uh, and I think the, um, the work which he's about to show tonight will be some kind of testimony to, the, to his creative imagination, which is highly individual. It's, um, it shows the work of his particular humor. And, and I think it would um, give a great insight into the things he's doing at the moment. The, uh, the, the project which really gave me some moment of, um, of some kind of reflection was when he worked on a thing called the Laboratory of Uncertainty. Is that right? Yep. Now, this was um, an invention which really came out of something which I suppose you would be in, in kind, some kind of opposition to now. We are in an age of reason, we're in an age of science, and we're in an age of correctness. And if you're looking at most of the time, the language that you hear in law, and in architecture, and in science, in academia, it's mostly to do with how you uh, explain how you've done it. It's to do with measurement, evaluation, it's to do with some kind of corporate pride, and to say how well you've done it and how close you got to the target. Um, but the laboratory of uncertainty was actually against all those things, the same way as neuromanticism was and the same way as punk. So um, I think what, we, um, what I really admire about Rodney is actually stood by his guns and he's continuing to um, formulate this bridge between art and architecture. I would say that there's really not too much difference, but Rodney likes to place himself in an artist performance uh, role. Now, um, these two things are coming together. And really, that wasn't too embarrassing, was it? No. The, the, um, so what, what I want to do now is please, would you put your hands together and welcome Rodney Place. Thank you. John, thanks. <laughs> thanks for leaving off the last five minutes. Um, yeah, John asked me whether I'd got serious, so I said yes. 
which is true. Um, it's kind of interesting that John mentioned the 70s because uh, I moved after 25 years away from South Africa. I moved back in 1996. And um, in, in many ways, it's kind of, there is a sort of amnesia here, I guess. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, you can always think rock music was best when you did um, stupid things to it or something. But uh, one of the things is that I think the situation in uh, Johannesburg and in, yes, in Johannesburg is actually ex very, very similar right now to um, how London was in the 70s, where uh, people squatted and did things like that. It's very difficult to realize after the 80s as uh, Britain joined Europe, sort of joined Europe, hasn't quite joined Europe, <laughs> Uh, that uh, has a kind of prosperity that wasn't really around, I don't think, in the 70s. Um, certainly the rand was worth one rand 40 to the pound, it's now worth 14 rand to the pound, so that's quite a big difference. But the thing was that uh, private property actually had boarded up a lot of houses, and um, in a funny kind of way the city was an interior that you couldn't get into. Um, and so there, there was like a legitimate squatting. And it's funny John should mention those clubs and things which only took place one night a week. And it's quite, uh, you, you know, that way in which um, you had to sort of grab at culture periodically and it wasn't set up as uh, sophisticatedly as it is now in London. So maybe for those of you who don't know the 70s, which wasn't a hippie time actually, it was quite an interesting time. It was quite dark, um, you know, rather than optimistic. But it made London seem like a place from which sometimes you felt excluded, not only as an ex-colonial or colonial or whatever. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, one thing, I, th there are a few people here like him, who knows a bit about Johannesburg, so I'd better watch out. Um, but one of the things that I hadn't quite realized coming back here was that, what? Yeah, but I like beaming. Yeah. You know me. <laughs> well, I quite like leaning. You know, I've always leaned. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, it's, it, it's really shocking how little colonialists know about colonies as opposed to the other way around. Um, so, giving talks here about Johannesburg, it's really shocking that Britain still knows Johannesburg or South Africa as apartheid and Nelson Mandela. Um, and it more or less, I think, knows, you know, apartheid was bad, like George Bush would have it. Apartheid is bad and Nelson Mandela is good, so you have heaven and hell. Um, and more or less on the principle of, of British philosophy of Carlyle, great heroes make great history, which then in French hands became great classes make great history, which then in Germany became great races make great history, um, according to um, to Ernst Cassera in his book called The Myth of the State. So in a way, you know, what's very, very difficult now is to struggle out of this paradigm of good and evil. Um, Tolstoy said, referring to Carlyle's view of history about great heroes make great history, he said that the new history was like deaf people replying to questions that nobody asked to which the US replied that history had come to an end, to which one could say that actually in our part of the world, history is just beginning, meaning it is a history of a new literacy. I actually feel like saying these things a little bit, not to set up work politically, but I actually I feel quite strongly about this, so it seems like a very good time to say that. Because the United States and Israel walked out of the racism conference. Now, it's true that South Africa is an enormously pretentious country. 
enormously pretentious, like an alcoholic who got cured yesterday and wants to set up a bloody institute the next day for alcoholics. Um, and that's a bit of a problem, you know, just see if you stay off it for a while, which South Africa hasn't, you know, it hasn't stayed off its racist uh, alcoholism or whatever it is, but nevertheless it believes that the whole world can come in and everything's going to be all right because we feel so good. Uh, what happened in South Africa was that a thing called the Truth and Reconciliation Committee happened in which every victim was allowed to speak. And all that was recorded on video and in extensive things and a lot of journalists went completely nuts and had to go into therapy because it was an extremely difficult period of time. Blah, blah. Okay. So the one thing about South Africa is that the reason I'm saying this is that the work I'm doing needs quite a lot of background until you feel like the background is the bloody project, you know, and you want to talk about, if you're talking about cricket and Don Bradman scoring 200 runs in Adelaide in 1950, blah, blah, and you try to explain this in the US, you actually have to explain there are three wickets at each end, 22 players, and there's some guys with jerseys around them, and by the time you've got to the bloody thing that you want to talk about, everybody's completely exhausted, which you probably are already. <laughs> or not. So anyway, South Africa is a very explicit country. Everything that the rest of the world thinks, it's like a five-year-old, it says, you know, like my mom and dad think you're really ugly. You know, that's South Africa, that's apartheid. It actually represents almost everything that the rest of the world, uh, at least the Western world, was really afraid to think. It carries on doing that. We're really bland and extremely literal. Um, the work that I'm doing, which will probably surprise people a bit, is, is kind of uh, urban. I was thought, so, so urban belonged to South Americans who said urban, urbanism, and I thought, oh, that's really important. I don't come from that um, tradition. Uh, but anyway, it is urban, and it is about Johannesburg. And one of the interesting things about apartheid, quite apart from everything that everybody knows, is that the um, the Afrikaans-speaking white population was 80% uh, uh, rural um, after the Second World War, and by the 1960s was 80% urban. So in a 20-year period, a large population had become urbanized, which still is the, um, it still is the, the thrust of the place. So looking at Johannesburg and trying to figure out what post-90 is like, it's still about not urbanism, but an urbanizing population, like a dynamic, a dynamic which is extremely difficult to track. Mm. Okay, pictures. In one of the things that I've always done and just carry on doing is make images to try and understand something. So, you know, if you can take these images as that, it's just a way, meaning I don't believe I've thought something till I make something. Um, I, five British experts were invited down to South Africa last March, last year, not this year. Um, and not one of them, oddly enough, lived in a city, but anyway. <laughs> You know, who knows? So I was asked by our government, because you do get funny things to do, even though you're weird or an artist or whatever it is. Or, um, so I did, after, we, we went through Cape Town, Durban and Johannesburg on a kind of a tour, tourist in your own country. Um, so I did, I did these pictures. This is called Cape Town, Southernmost Tip of Europe which is more or less, you know, like a mental state of the place. And Cape Town is the southernmost tip of Europe. Um, there's an enormous population waiting to enter, but rather like Marilyn Monroe, you know, you can look, but don't touch. Um, this is Durban, where, where Africa meets, uh, you know, traditionally long before colonialism meets a 
called uh, Durban and the Indian Rim. Uh, down there on the bottom right is a Qantas Airlines, that's where you can escape to. But otherwise you're completely subject to the Middle East and Indian subcontinent as a kind of a sense of that place. So one of the funny things is that in a way cities were quite held together by apartheid as a single ideology and suddenly after 94 it seemed to me that they'd been released into their kind of uh, mental geography. To, to their distinction, if, if you want. And this is Johannesburg, which still, you know, was part of Cecil John Rhodes' vision um, of a Cape Town to Cairo rail link. Um, and it, it functions. Johannesburg, I was told, not only in terms of Africa, but uh, actually in the East as well, is the num number one immigrant city if you can't get into a western city. In other words, it, it has a kind of, uh, you, you know, almost like an a alternative New York or like a punk New York, to use John's thing, like a, an, another sense of New York, but you, it's a place where you can make it. And it has a, you know, it has a gold, it's a gold rush city, so it carries on being a gold rush mentality. Um, where my studio is, there are um, in 15 houses, did a quick survey, there were 12 African countries in 15 houses already, you, you know, so it's becoming uh, a major sort of uh, cosmopolitan African city. Now I just want to go back a little bit to uh, I, I suppose, uh, just to show you some sort of previous work, just quick, quite quickly. Um, I was asked to do a piece for the Adelaide Festival in 96 and did these drawings which were, in which I, I was interested in the, the idea of these cities in the southern hemisphere being like uh, ocean liners that got grounded. You, you know, like, because probably by the end of the 19th century the idea of a European city or whatever was extremely clear. It's not a, it's a, a known quantity. Um, and so in a way, cities in our part of the world or in the southern hemisphere seem to me to function like known things which were brought then. Uh, this is just based on a, a 10 pound tourist to Australia after the Second World War. 10 pound she on the left, 10 dollar he, I mean 10 pound she on the left, right? 10 pound he on the left. So I made this piece, which this was called Five White Sisters. This is just drawings, you know, to find out what I was doing. Um, the P&O lines that took Australian immigrants to Australia were between the First and Second World War were called the Five White Sisters, and oddly enough, it's resulted in five. <laughs> this is sort of like five white cities, really. <laughs> and also the upside down world of the Southern Hemisphere. This is. This piece was made for these paddle boats, which was extremely irritating to the curator of the show, um, because it was meant to be about Adelaide as the last Baroque city and so on, but I thought it was about Nikes and running around in sports pavilions. Um, these boats went through this thing, and those mirrors turned you upside down, and you looked out through portholes, which turned Australia upside down. And it had a soundtrack, which was the uh, the BBC World Service, da 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 And it was taken through the Suez Canal and so on and distorted by all the cities on the way. So that's what it was like, those sort of portable things. <clears throat> anyway, it had, it had the Canberra sinking. I think the Canberra's last job was to um, be a troop ship in the Falklands, interestingly enough. Okay, so now to Johannesburg. I'm, I'm doing a project called Retrex. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Great Trek was the journey into the interior of South Africa, like how the West was won. 
um, so that's how Southern Africa was one. And Retrex is, it actually came from an advertisement outside Joburg on a big billboard which said, we make more, t we, make, we sell more tires than anybody else in South Africa and we don't even make them. And it's re retra uh, you know, like Retrex, retreaded tires. Uh, it's like a revisit. This is called backwards into the world. What's really interesting about the European countries, despite what they're doing up here, that is the British consulate in Joburg, which was built about five years ago. The Italians have a kind of postmodern, kind of Disney version of Italy, which is their consulate. The British have a postmodern Disney version of their consulate. So what European countries, French are better and so are the Dutch, Germans also. Uh, but what other European countries are tending to do is not share their present with South Africa. They're sort of sh humoring white South Africans' idea of their past. Um, from those sort of ship things, I was thinking really about how, South, you know, a, a kind of allegory of, of two great floods. One at the end of the 19th century, which was the gold rush that brought Johannesburg as a ship to be landed on the high fill. Oddly enough, it was an inland sea um, and the gold, I should just go back a little bit, but the, the ships that carried immigrants after the Second World War, you know, European immigrants, have ended up in interesting situations. They've ended up as restaurants in California, housing projects in Hong Kong and Malaysia, and as reefs in Australia. In other words, they sink them to make artificial reefs. So it's like a, this, this construct that then, then finds its local place according to its local conditions. Um, so this is the first great flood, how Joburg arrived. Um, mm. Let me just try and explain this project a little bit. Retrex, having realized that architecturally, artistically, and in very many ways, the constructs for looking at work are very limited. If you do an art show in Johannesburg and you do another art show, you see exactly the same 400 people. So it becomes quite interesting to wonder in a city of six million people where the hell <laughs> you can kind of put something, you know. I, it has all those vanities to do with how these things function in the rest of the world or in the Western world. But so I made a set of 14 postcards, which were in 99, which are these, which were a, a kind of um, program, if you want. They're available in bookshops and airports and things like that. Um, but. They're like a prelude to this project that then has taken dance forms, large events, a 40,000 copy newspaper, just in a way to, which was distributed um, in Cape Town, Durban, you know, just, just to kind of take a work and put it out there, you know, to, to, to try and find an audience. It's an extremely fragmented place. And these are quite, you know, they're quite big projects which, which put you in the realm of politics and getting money for projects and all those sort of things that are incredibly uh, boring and time consuming. But they're not boring, actually, because it's quite interesting to not make an assumption about where a piece of work can go. There are no architectural magazines to speak of. There are no art magazines, it's nothing. So in a way, there is this thing you're making and you wonder how to put it somewhere. So, so in a way, it goes back to what Harold Rosenberg said, which is basically that he said a, a, a work of art or whatever makes its audience, not the other way around. It's, it's, it's not a, a space to put something into. It's a space you have to make with the work. Oh, that sounds too... Important. Okay. The other part of this um, this great flood analogy was in 1994 occurred what I call the second great flood, which is where um, this modernist construction not only got stuck but sunk 
and then a kind of exotic uh, world, exotic to European eyes, but actually quite functional <clears throat> and necessary and the next stage of a city like Rome, um, inhabits it. So these are just images I made, big boat, small boat, you know. Okay, now what Retrex does is it takes four viewpoints. Um, and I'll concentrate more on the immigration into the modernist inner city. Um, but I'll just take you quickly through this. And I have, I have some videos of some of the work that's gone on to other forms, because it's multidisciplinary and multi-form, this project. Um, but part of this is just to deal with uh, the northern suburbs of, of um, South Africa, which has been described as the richest square kilometer in Africa. It's probably the, one of the richest square kilometers in the world, in fact, rather than in Africa, meaning it's, it's more sustained than Beverly Hills. I lived in LA, and certainly Santon goes for seven kilometers without taking a breath of wealth. Um, now, one of the things is that somebody asked me why, you know, why is Joburg, northern suburbs, so Italian? Well, I think it's, I, I think it's, um, South Africa has kind of pathological postmodernism. You know, it's not a style, it's an absolute need. It's like a, a yeah, it's a pathology, really. A, a pathology of, of um, needing to belong to a thing, even if you realize that the thing you belong to has just moved on for 30 years. It's like the architectural professions in South Africa. You go, what? You know, didn't... Uh, have you seen anything in the last 30 years? But it, it's a kind of a, you know, pathology of style. Um, it's not made of chicken wire, it's made of genuine article, you know, like thick carving. So, in, in the... South Africa's always had this, this sort of North American suburban idea of a city in the 70s. It's not just an apartheid-induced thing, it's just a, it's a consumption-induced thing. Um, and apartheid sort of sustained it in an Italian way, rather like Hadrian's villa as that pleasure dome or whatever was sustained by Hadrian's wall, which kept the Scots out. Um, so I've, this is meant to be bloody funny, you know. This is, um, apartheid had as, as its romantic or as its propaganda objective to protect ethnic <laughs> Africa from the intrusions of modernism. Um, now, oddly, there's a reversal, which is that there's a kind of protection of Europe from African modernism, and which has been built into this. So, apartheid kind of sustained Hadrian's Wall for Santon, and then suddenly, when apartheid was demolished, it became um, it became it had to sustain itself, which it does incredibly successfully, and I'll explain later. Anyway, this is called Umlungu after... So I've created in Retrex an Umlungu stan, like a Bantu stan. Apartheid had uh, Bantu stans, which were for ethnically black people, and now there is a thing called an Umlungu stan, which Umlungu in Zulu means white person. So it's a sort of ethnically pure European part of the world. By the way, BMW gave money to this project and then freaked. How do you, ah, uh, you're doing the wrong thing here. Okay, this is called traditional life. These are just some postcards that are the program for this. It will be a fashion show design part of this because Santon's very, very interested in design. Um, oddly enough, what, what Santon does, a little like Hollywood, but much more successfully, is it fal falsifies the whole world, meaning it it falsifies Africa, falsifies Europe, and it, it just manages to contain the world within its walls, almost like a, a really a, a movie set you can hurt your knee on. This is called Zebra Crossing, and this is called Lion Lager. Lion Lager is a very popular beer in South Africa. <clears throat> now, 
I mean, you, you're aware of Beverly Hills. The thing is that this is the bourgeois democratization, if you want, of Hollywood stars. In Santon, they were right crew. It looks like a game reserve all the time, this vast suburb with, a, with shopping malls and stuff. But those gates are erected to kind of keep residents safe. You know this is a pattern from Sao Paulo to LA, wherever. But um, this, interestingly enough, as the, you know, as Hadrian's Wall got demolished, it's now become manifest in a kind of a building, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a style of a gate, which is really a bit like 18th century Europe, I think. Um, you know, where you, bull, where you build bourgeois into, <clears throat> that's a gate to a, new, new gates now, new competing gates to suburbs. Okay, the next part of Retrix is what happened to all the uh, Calvinist apartheid operatives, which um, I call the cowboy Calvinist part of this project. Th these are the actors in, a, in what will be a kind of, um, what's called in South Africa, pusbuki. South Africa couldn't afford to have TV, meaning politically, for quite a long time. And so it had picture storybooks um, into the 70s. Anyway, the, a lot of um, operatives in the apartheid regime have become private security companies, private, um, uh, you know, pick up places. There are lots and lots of accidents, you know, because the cars are not up to the roads, really. So these guys wait out for an accident to happen. I'll go quickly through this. So, and this is part of that sort of, uh, you know, almost Arizona-like idea of, of the urban landscape as a kind of cliff-like alien place, Calvinist. I think Calvinism is very good at keeping water out of countries and fighting battles and things like that, but it's very, very bad at making civil societies. Okay, next part is to do what's called, I'm, this is, of, I'm doing a dance performance piece, video piece called The Washing of the Soaps. Because um, also, rather like Brazil, South Africa, soap opera is ahead of the reality, actually. It's, it's um, somebody in the States asked me why white people voted yes in the referendum, and I said I thought it was the Bill Cosby show, because the Bill Cosby show was very heavily watched in the 80s, and I don't think any white South Africans had ever seen a black person, ha you know, with kids with psychological problems, and this, this is, you know, as a genuine sort of middle-class thing. And the, the transfer of characters is really quite amazing in, um, in soap opera in South Africa, it's infinitely replaceable. And it's a very, very consumer society. In other but the government seems to believe that consumption, rather like the US, will hold its society together um, at the expense of culture or anything like that. Consumption is the glue. This is a, sorry, I don't want to talk about projects that, uh, you know, if you want to look at the videos and things like that, I just want to get to the city part of this. So this is just a, you know, quick rush through. This is a still from the dance performance piece, which we did in pilot for a 12 minute piece. It'll be a 60 minute piece next year. Okay, um, I just want to go back to central Joburg, which is the last, you know, sort of where I'll spend most of, time here. This is on this, what is very, very clear in central Johannesburg, it is a city, you know, probably averaging 10, 15 stories in its center as buildings. What's really interesting is that two thirds of the vertical dimension is not occupied. In other words, it's a city occupied enormously in the horizontal plane probably busier than it's ever been in its history, and yet the vertical is completely empty. It's a completely strange thing. A, a French um, documentary guy came who makes documentaries on cities, and he freaked out. He said he's never seen this, that the streets are absolutely full, and the vertical dimension is, is empty. So I'll just, this is a bit like a travel log. That's all right. 
So I started doing these images of these two. This was a, 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 for a shop front installation in the center of Joburg. It had strobe light, so the water looked like it was moving. It came from a Benoni lampshade <laughs> that I liked when I was seven. Anyway, part, part of this is also that there are two cities trying to be made in Johannesburg at the moment, and it's not a mega city in the sense of Lagos or, you know, those well-known and much liked almost as pornography cities that are happening in the third world. It's a city with a probably more plumbing than any other city because South Africa, you had to have toilets for both sexes for black, Asian, white. So most buildings are kind of like spaghetti junction. Um, but into this is this intrusion of the of a new city, which is like on the left. Any time there's empty space, there's a new city being made, and almost the defence of the old city. But we'll get onto that later. Um, in the way, I then just you know, in that way that you just push an image to see what would happen if the if the one city became the other city. This is called. Uh, Johannesburg, a new African metropolis. There's a tomato crates and things, <clears throat> which you see a lot. So this is just, you know, blah, blah. Most buildings have entire building to let. <laughs> just, Joburg is almost made up now of these signs of an empty 10-story, at least, um, and then to me, what, and, and all, all this information is building to a, a kind of event project that I did in Johannesburg that I'll show you on video. Um, but one, there's a funny kind of reclamation of space. That South Africa, rather like um, parts of Central America, have a larger private security than they do a police force. So. The, it's part of the reclamation of space. This corner is designated by a guard. Now what's really interesting in the postmodern sense is that a lot of these, these security companies then take the look of a European thing. Like there's one security company that dresses everybody up as gendarmes from uh, Paris. Others have, um, have sort of checkered English police helmet, you know. So in a way, you think, oh, cool, you know, European security company, that's good, even if the people are not white Europeans, you know? So I, you know, these images, these postcards were just sort of creating a program, if you want, for, for um, retrex. This was when the Queen came and a security company that later collaborated in this event. Uh, another thing that's happened is that a lot of the military equipment has been redecorated. That, that tank-like thing. Yeah. Those were used uh, a lot in the school, in the school uh, suppressions of the 80s, and security companies take them and repaint them. <laughs> so you know, messed around with. Um, camouflage for town and suburb. Okay, I'll show you a videotape in a second. Th this is just uh, from Amsterdam, a picture I took. I, I was asked by, oddly enough, a property development company whether I could use a nine-story empty car park in Johannesburg because, uh, you know, can you get something going? So I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, which was just to, to do a show that tried quite strategically and deliberately to occupy the vertical dimension in Johannesburg, which was more or less empty except for some housing things that you'll see in the video, you know, flats. Um, and Oddly enough, you know, in that sense of bland engineering modernist space, the screen fit perfectly well in Amsterdam as it does in Joburg, probably as it does in Hong Kong. You know, it's based on an on a inadvertent dimension. 
unselfconscious. So this, then in, in a way, you know, the last project I did at this place in the late 70s was called Event into Architecture. So it's like a revisit of, of that. What, one of the things that interested me was that if Johannesburg was empty at night, which is true, you could take, it's a city of six million people, but it's entirely fragmented, so it's incredibly parochial as you go from part to part. So part of the deliberate strategy of the show was to combine odd pieces of the suburbs in a way in the center. Um, so it was ho hopefully a bit more than a, a kind of art show. In fact, called it a, an urban opera, you know, in three acts. There was a parade, and then visual art, which tried to put in a performance sense of the pieces were commissioned for seven minutes, nine and a half um, meters. And then on top was a performance and music thing. As the audience went up through this building and also just to develop a kind of a mock architectural plan, which was to do with uh, performance things rather than what rather than elements of the space or so these were the these were the after drawings but we did before drawings for this so these are just the elements of the plan these screens occurred across each floor nine meters across you went up through six stories. It's a little like a kind of a crude Guggenheim in a way. <clears throat> and those were the walls made out of um, beer crates. <clears throat> we made all these walls out of the, um, plastic beer crates. Okay, so the better part of this is to look at the... How do I turn the... Okay, can we show that? So here's a short pilot of how the show was when it was in Joburg last September.
כן. Yeah, I was st- and sort of had a thought, a thought while looking at that that you know that there's actually the, the, the sounds too victimized really but you know there's very little theory um, in Johannesburg despite its sort of uh, material sophistication and I think one of the things you you do there is is you um, you you make a thing in order to produce the theory for it so you know I suppose in in, in the uh, in the lexicon of urbanism that happened around here you know it's like a social condensing idea and so on and so forth you know but the the social condensing idea does not exist in Johannesburg so you have to make a show to demonstrate what it is well what happened um, after that was that I kind of you, you know in that way in which you can do an event and you say okay it's an event that's cool but but uh, will you follow it with anything that's um, that's actually to do with not ma- jo- Johannesburg is a lot about reoccupation it's a lot about reprogramming it has massive amounts of empty space and so um, it's an issue to to reprogram it rather than to build more space but what came up was a project to to propose a public space in what was called the cultural precinct of Johannesburg called Newtown. Um, so in a way used the car park as a as a program for making a public space in Johannesburg and trying to do something about this horizontal idea. Anyway we'll just go back into Johannesburg on a African sunset night. there it is now part of what's curious is is that there are developed plans happening in Johannesburg and what's curious is that they uh, you'll probably be fairly horrified when I tell you that the major urban planners and architects of central Johannesburg have videotapes of Leo Crea and Elizabeth Plates as their as their their bedrock of good architectural community planning so there's absolutely no way that they have any other reference point so what tends to happen in Johannesburg is like although you can listen to a lot of post-colonialism the way you actually start to do things in in central Johannesburg in this vast emptiness is to (laughs) reclaim space more or less like this car park, steel fence, guards, recolonizing the space in a way. Um, because right next to that, when you don't recolonize the space, you get another city breaking out. So it's this kind of tale of battle of two cities there. That's a, another kind of city happening. Anyway, that's just to kind of further show that. Um, In their redevelopment plan, um, this, at La Villette or anything else, this building would probably be this fancy restaurant or some gathering place or whatever. This is the they claim the absolute central place is the development offices. First thing you do, build a steel fence around it. On top of that is a very high voltage fence. It's why I don't... So, you know, Joburg is like a military operation, you know, in which there is in which the center of the city is being reclaimed as a suburb because the suburbs are seen to be quite successful in the paradigm of consumption but certainly not successful in terms of 12 African countries and 15 houses that is not considered successful um, 
part of what's interest this is the Johannesburg has kind of had that classic, I guess, 50s or whatever planning, which put the sports arenas on the eastern side of the city, central business district, and on the western side it was designated cultural. Well, part of why it was designated cultural was because these set of buildings were built in the 70s when the last sort of grey area in central Johannesburg, grey area being completely mixed race between Indian black and white, was this edge. So what happened was that Helmut Jan being, you know, one of the great corporate stylists of all time, was invited to build the corporate headquarters there, which is probably one of his more beautiful buildings, but I mean, what they constructed was a beautiful wall um, in order to displace an Indian population on our side of the photograph and keep a corporate pop now, it seems to me that what Johannesburg is trying to do is get that back and then treat some culture as trickle down. Uh, the mint is in there as well, the impenetrable mint that makes currency for, this, this is all getting too, too serious, but the mint makes currency for countries, I think, like Sweden. So it's not only, <laughs> which is very attractive to be making a foreign currency right in Joburg. This building on the left was occupied by squatters who started to dig a tunnel and <laughs> into the mint. And they, the city manager said, this is terrible. And I said, well, Joburg's always made its money from mining, you know, so why not a new generation of bloody mining? You know? uh, now, on the eastern side of Joburg, this is what's sort of happening to those uh, uh, modernist constructs. I think there's a sense in, in Newtown of trying to preserve that, you know, of trying to make a territory in which um, that is preserved. It's like revisiting modernism as opposed to modernism revisited. So, so also this area is becoming extremely specific actually in terms of, um, you know, what exactly is there with the look of it. <coughs> and then parts of the pavement are reclaimed as part of the shop. And above that, it's empty. Now, the, this in a way was information for this proposal, which was part of the competition that of course we had absolutely no hope in hell of winning, but anyway, you do it. Um, the other big space that's really a successful cultural space in Africa and spent December in Dakar and Yusandu and people, you know, the political rallies and stadiums and, you know, the stadium is a, is a big public and cultural space as well as being a place where you watch soccer teams. <laughs> this was designed for Manchester actually but it ended up in South Africa. <laughs> South African soccer crowds are extremely peaceful, so I don't know. I think this was in expectation of a large ANC rally that they built this, which in fact happened later on. Um, anyway, you know, it doesn't, you don't buy scarves through the internet from China. Kind of people make their own thing, more or less in the sense of the Day of the Dead or, or of festivals in Mexico or whatever. You, have to make your own gear to come to a soccer game. This was a big, uh, the sort of main, you know, it's like, this is Kaiser Chiefs playing um, Orlando Pirates, which is the equivalent of Liverpool playing Manchester United, say, or Chelsea and Spurs, or... Um, those hats are made from those are hard hats which are then cut out and, and then made into uh, molded and heated and stuff to make. Okay, so this was a sort of staking the territory of this design. <laughs> a bit rusty at design. <laughs> um, it was just to sort of try and make a thing which was uh, a, a public space, a large, large public space in Newtown, um, rather than a, 
the, the planning instructions which were that everybody knew public space was made out of a void between buildings. You, you know, didn't exist as anything else. Um, I don't know, these are, you know, the, the kind of things you do to, to get information for what you're doing. The East Gate, South Gate, North Gate and West Gate are shopping malls which are the entrances through a concrete highway that combines all the suburbs of Johannesburg around the edge. So, you know, usual US style city. Um, and that's the, Johannesburg is a, a manufacturing or a mining or whatever city, it's not an administrative capital or uh, money well, it is a money city now, but I mean, it started with the factory in the backyard. So it has a big uh, industrial landscape. Um, so, I don't know. The Basically, it was to try and treat the space like the car park, like the car park project. Paint the highway red, give it a name. Um, make it into a fish tank at night, you know, <coughs> to give it a sense of something going north and south. And then to propose what amounted to, um, to treating the whole of public space like a performance space in which that red part at the top is what was called African Bowl. It's based uh, all along the pavements of Johannesburg are plastic plates holding fruit. And this space had the section of that, somewhat stadium-like, just a turned up plate edge. Um, I, I think I probably should say some sort of city-like city things, huh? But, I don't know. Basically, all, all that corporate wall I was talking about happens here. These are the only, t these are the only two streets that link um, what was a displaced Indian population to the central city. And that was a kind of night view of this. It has a kind of highway that you look down from all the time. Billboards. So that rail link would um, move the lighting around to make different performance spaces. Uh, this project was also going to be phased in, in the way of each time something was built it would have a festival. So it wouldn't be done one shot. Those, those sort of light things would be done by African sculptors from all, you know, sculpt African sculptors, that's like sort of saying southern writers or woman writers or something like that. Sculptors from around the continent um, to make the light shade stage things, the little ones. Uh, that's the interior of it. Uh, and then the highway would make a proscenium to this big space. I mean, there are seriously, this area routinely has 30,000 people going to rave gigs and things like that. But what they tend to do is, is really get serious military equipment. I mean, what, double row barbed wire to make up the space for a rave. Interior. It's looking towards the highway. I don't, um, yeah, and that's the stage. Okay, then along the edge were 100 trading booths based on the kind of size of the pavement that you occupy to trade so that to keep the trading street continuous, which is what's happening there now. Um, so there's trading booths. Then the next part of this festival idea to be built over, say, three or four years was that Africa still has a very strong tradition of, of um, sign painters. Really amazing stuff like French comics or, or whatever. It's a, it's a, 
it's a push thing. In other words, it's not just a, you know, Mr. Bloggs the Butcher kind of thing. <clears throat> this is a Ghanaian work. But all these hundred booths would then be turned into a show once the traders were established in that, as a client for the painter. I mean, part of this was just also to try and deal with the city horizontally, you know, to deal with it only horizontally, because I do think in Johannesburg, until there's some sense of what has happened horizontally, you might as well forget, no matter how pretty it is or whatever, um, what is going to happen vertically, because there's, a, there's an enormous um, difference in cultural space that happens on the horizontal plane. So, you know, the, these are, it, it sounds like an apology for these, but it's quite difficult to go between a dance piece and event and so on. You know, maybe it's pretentious and maybe it's a bit sort of dilettantish, but in a funny kind of way, the, there's an enormous amount of art research to take place in Johannesburg, which is observational research of laying the grounds for doing something rather than assuming that you have the ability to do it because the political and commercial constructs they really don't exist so you know the you 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 have a kind of it sounds too heavy to say you have an imaginative responsibility there but you you have an image uh, a responsibility for making images because otherwise all one's confronted with in South Africa is habit well, unfortunately, the habits, you know, so you lose a bloody competition, so what, because you knew you'd lose it in the first place. But oddly enough, what this lost to was a tower, <laughs> which is amazing. No ground plane, nothing, just a tower with a guard and an elevator. I, don't, I don't, still don't know what they intended for this tower, but this was what the city seemed to want to go along with the Nelson Mandela Bridge, which is a commercial idea. Um, yeah, I, I, I do want to say this. What is very interesting in the new South African constitution is that the government is obliged to house homeless people, but the privatizing thing, in other words, Johannesburg has more or less in its development been given into private hands under pressure from the US and, and World Bank and so on to give the city into private hands, in which case empty buildings become private matters. They don't become public matters. So the, whenever you do a thing, there you get into the realm of politics and and the world situation, which personally I find exhausting, but also very very interesting because you know having a space in which to work has limits. A nice comfortable spot in which to work. It's quite funny to see how seriously images are threatening. Anyway, having built a tower, what was interesting, the ja there was a jazz festival held and the event company did exactly the scheme, but they did it for three days. That was the stage they made against the thing. And so it's, it's quite reassuring in a way that when people do things just in the course of, of making an event, they do that rather than when they forced to be self-conscious, but Cedric Price gave a very interesting lecture before he withdrew from meaning <laughs> in the late 70s and 80s when he was talking about the oil derricks that were being made in Scotland. Um, that he said it was quite funny that people would accept anything if it went away. Okay, thank you very much. Be happy to try and answer questions or dialogues or Okay. The, um, 
One thing I was going to mention, but I decided not to, but I will mention it now. Rodney's mentioned it because um, I think it bears um, some relation to his lecture. Um, was that during the time he was a student here, there was um, a street in Islington called Queen's Head Street. It was um, an amazing street for a while. From that period, there was um, a squatting movement and a whole batch of people were squatting in, in this street, most of them from the AA. Some of the names you probably know, some not, but um, amongst them there's Peter Wilson, there was Jal Basto, Anne Brooks, Patricia Pringle, um, and else? Jenny Lowe, and plus some cobblers, some perspex workers, some musicians, and a whole batch. And it was actually a really, really exciting time. Rodney's light was always on, wasn't it? It was always on. He was working all the time. There was also in this street the great parties. And so I think what, what really came from Rodney's talk tonight was um, this incredible energy and relentlessness about this um, the experimentation invention which he has. Now, what I would really like, just for a, just for a few minutes or just the even maybe less, but I think you should fire away at some questions, really, because there's a lot of things he hasn't mentioned. And I, I reckon if you could ask some questions, he's going to come up and answer them. Try and not be too long, because I fancy going out and having something to eat. <laughs> OK. Person there, did you touch your ear, or was it the, uh, no? no I was say, OK. Um, Towards a what? Corporate hold. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, if I've, if I've put across that I'm some kind of missionary, I really hope I haven't, you know. I mean, basically, you, 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 you operate into a context to to make it to try and deflect it in some way. What's very interesting about South Africa is that there is just an enormous amount of of grey areas. There's probably more grey area in corporations and in politics than there are certainly in the USA, for instance. You, you know, in other words, people who um, I mean, the guy who gave me the car part to deal with, you finally sit down and you say, you know, what did you do? And say, well, he fell in love with an Indian woman and then joined the ANC, you know. So you say, really? So he was underground for a long time, so suit, blah, blah. And, you know, what, what's always been true of South Africa is, is that um, there's been, like, the secret now, the, the point sometimes of doing a project is whether you hit somebody in that secret. You, you, you know, some situations are so well-formed. And, you know, contemporary art in the West, for instance, is incredibly well-formed. I mean, you get a trained bunch of people who go in and look at a thing, don't understand, don't like, and are not interested in, stay for two hours. You, you know, without opening, saying, this is boring. You, you know, now what, what's curious there is that, I mean, so, some of the funny things about doing an event, you think, oh, it's real hip and it's got hip hop and it's got all this. What you never realize is that you're going to get a tank there. You know, get a tank and that seems like a nice idea, but you actually move somebody. The, the, did you see all the guys sitting in that tank? That was the first time they'd been in a tank since they were called up in the army to do the Soweto riots in the 80s. And the guy, you know, come up and say, oh, you know, that is the first time I've been in a tank since the 80s. And, you, you know, it's... 
sounds too bloody confessional or religious, but there is a certain sense of relief. And you, you never know when you're making art or whatever you're doing of how your intention is nowhere near what people are experiencing, but you set something up in a certain way. Now, will South Africa get better? Will Britain get better? That would be my question. Will the USA get better? Will it get better? You, you know what I mean? I mean, our, we're not victims. You know, we're just voices. And the point of this work is to make voices. That's all. To make voices. Allow people to speak. You, you know, it, it's simple. It's simple. You know, we will not be victimized. It's finished. You know. I mean, it's a very difficult thing now because in a way, that's, a, that's what's a real problem with the African city. It's probably a new formation of a city in the world. You, you know, a new formation of a city in the world. And yet it's treated like a bloody basket case, you know, like a problem. You know, hello, here's a problem. Hello, how do you do? I'm a problem. You, you know, it's not... I mean, cities in the West are regarded as constructs, cultural constructs. This is what Africa is producing. But African cities are like, oh, we're so sorry for you. you know. And in a way, you know what's wrong with South Africa is it's being held up by Europe right now. You know, it had a seven year, I mean, th this is a very heavy comment, actually. Yes, it's true that Nelson Mandela is a hero. Yes, it's true he went to jail. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. But basically, we had a breathing space to be a civil society after the end of the Cold War. It looks really as if that breathing space is about to be closed again. So I don't think we should join this rubbish. You, you know what I mean? There is no way in the polarization of the world you have no space to grow. You know, it's like being with arguing parents all the bloody time. You, OK, so will it get better? Um, well, the point is, the more one can, the more one feel, a very good uh, South African intellectual called, called Vincent Mapai, you know, with, I mean, what a weird guy, you know, he, the reason he went to university was because his mother ran a Shabin, which is an illicit bar, produced him enough money for him to go to university. He's a major intellectual, got bought out by SAB to be their like marketing or public relations guy. Really, very good salary. Told this joke on himself. His mother said, oh my God, you know, I thought, remember the family had escaped from a Shabin, now you're working in the biggest bloody Shabin in South Africa. You, you know, but one of the things he did say wa was that he thought, that the unfortunate thing about South Africa, both externally and internally, and I think there are many countries of the world that suffer from that, is that the democracy is only defined in terms of politics. It is not defined in terms of intellect or culture you, or imagination. Sorry. Blah, blah. And so projects like this are to try and define, you know, in, and, and that's not, hopefully not too grandiose, but just to try to define an imagination or something that goes with our democracy rather than just concentrate on the politics and I think at the root of a question about will it get better as a political question culturally it's better already the Mapansula the Pansula dancers well, I mean, they, they've developed a, a particular dance form in the townships that came off jive, you know, mixture between jive and, and sort of tribal, you know, it's like one of those urban forms that is not hip-hop and it's not, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit off watching Michael Jackson, like it's fast footwork, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah they are, they're great. Yeah, yeah. It's more deeper than that for you as an individual. So what do you think I mean in, in the other hand to um, help, not helping it in, in a sense of helping but um, making you relieve to this emotion to yourself? <laughs> you know, 
Yeah, no, it's quite... You know, you mean, can one be objective and reasonable about it? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I... Well, hell, I mean, you know, I, I remember Rem giving a, 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 a talk in Philadelphia in which he said he thought he was too sensitive to be an urban designer or something like that, you know. <laughs> And you go, yeah, right. <laughs> Come down to Joburg, you'll be dead, dude. <laughs> you know, it's, a, well, you, well, you need something to sustain your energy there. But do, do, to, to, to do a project like this, nobody says we'd like a project like this. You know what I mean? You deal with the politics of it, you deal with raising money for it, and you do all that. So in a way, that keeps you plenty reasonable enough. So if I've gone slightly emotional at this point, you know, um, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>